So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasul al-Kareem. I am very, 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 very thankful to Allah for our guest today. And I'm sure by the end of this conversation, you will be too. And maybe a little bit fearful. Um, this is the brother who can tell you how Dijjal is going to control our food. Okay. And so, Brother Amir, please introduce yourself a little bit, if you don't mind, and after that we'll go straight into the topic. This is an extremely, please share this with as many people, you know, I've never ever really said this in this way, but this is is such a significant thing. It's like, it's almost as significant as knowing that paper money is not real money, what you're going to learn today, inshallah. So please share this with as many people as possible. And uh, Brother Amir is going to explain to you what's happening with our food and why it matters and why there is an urgency and a possible solution that he's also working on uh, regarding that. Okay, so Brother Amir, I want you to just speak your heart out and tell us how is Dijjal or how does it seem Dijjal is going to control food? Right. Um, so, Bismillah. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, <clears throat> well, we all know that, um, and I'm also a believer of this, uh, that we actually don't really know when the Dajjal is going to come, but we anticipate uh, his arrival. And uh, we've actually entered into a time where the markings of the the, the presence of the Dajjal, actually, the markings began during the time of the Prophet, but um, they seem to be accelerating uh, very quickly. Um, now again, we don't know if it's going to come in. He is going to come in our lifetimes, but um, there is an urgent need. There are other things that are happening in the world, especially in the Western um, hemisphere, where we need to start acting. But before I get into that, um, I uh, I was born in England. Um, my parents are Pakistani, uh, and I'm a product of the West. Um, I lived um, for three years in Africa, and I spent about 20 plus years in New York where I got my education, um, went to university there, went to graduate school there, uh, joined Wall Street, and then uh, ended up um, out of personal, from a personal situation in Toronto. Um, my story actually begins um, when, I, when I talk about what I'm doing, the work that I'm doing, usually to investors or to people who are interested. I begin with a story of me being sick. And um, as far back as my adolescence, or even pre-adolescence as a child, uh, I remember suffering from headaches, for instance. And um, the headaches at that time were innocuous. You perhaps pop a pill or sleep it off, and the headaches go away. Um, but I was working on Wall Street, um, and during my time on Wall Street, I used to get my headaches, but my headaches weren't just normal headaches. They were severe migraines. They were so severe that I used to have to go to the ER to get uh, medication. Uh, the over-the-counter medication like Imitrex, I think that was over-the-counter, uh, stopped working and I used to be administered codeine or Demerol. And I remember this one time where I was sitting on the hospital gurney and my caregiver was approaching me with a needle to you know, to administer the Demerol to me. And the only thing I could think of as she was approaching, and I was in seething pain, was grabbing that needle and sticking it into my temple. And then there's the eczema. Um, again, in my pre-adolescence, I had dry skin. And again, we just innocuously, it's innocuous. It doesn't really matter. Oh, it's dry skin, no problem. Just put some moisturizer, moisturizer on it and uh, it'll be fine. Um, but as my life progressed and as I got to Wall Street, um, where I had a job that was essentially sucking the soul out of me. I was on Wall Street for 15 years. Um, and that stress, it was great. I was having the time of my life and on once, in one sense, sitting on top of the world, working with, um, lots of money and, um, very big marquee deals. Um, I used to suffer from eczema. I, my, my dry skin had turned into full-blown eczema. And my eczema was so bad that when I used to pick up my briefcase, my palms would tear. Mm. And when you used to stick out my, stick out your hand to shake it, when somebody would stick out their hand to shake it, you, you're not going to say, I'm not going to shake your hand. 
there you have to shake it. That's part of the mm. culture. Anywhere is part of the culture. Um, and I used to shake my hands like this. And I'm basically, if you're able to watch me, my hands are slightly angled so that they wouldn't feel the roughness and the oozing. Sometimes my hands would ooze. Um, the eczema was so severe. severe. But if you can see now, my hands are c c completely perfect. Mm. So the, the journey ultimately... Uh, Again, from a personal standpoint, um, I ended up leaving Wall Street after 15 years and uh, coming to Toronto, and I met someone, and that someone was a naturopathic doctor, and she started talking about um, medicines such as magnesium. She gave me minerals and magnesium and omega-3s and probiotics, just a handful, not a whole bunch of them, and my eczema and my migraines went away. Mm. And I sat back and I was like, what are minerals and what's magnesium and <laughs> where does it come from? <laughs> and uh, long story short, magnesium is food for the cells. It comes from food, plants, and that's what we're not getting in our everyday food. And so I began to peel away the layers to find out, okay, well, what is magnesium? Where does it come from? Oh, it comes from food. Food comes from a farm. Where are our farms? What's happening to our farms? They grow food, they grow food in soil. What's in the soil? You know, and peel, 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 peel. And I was mortified, mortified with what I found. Mm. And um, at that time, I was in sort of a, I guess, a semi-retirement mode looking for a product. And we're looking for a project to do something meaningful in life, something where I could serve, maybe work for the UN or do something like that. Uh, and I, I was, that was my aha moment uh, about seven years in after leaving Wall Street, basically sitting around raising my kids. And uh, as it, because I was reeling off of, in 2001, we were reeling off in 9-11 and a whole bunch of Muslim issues. And so it was very important as a Muslim to make sure that I raise my kids as upstanding citizens of the world. And so it was okay for me. I didn't have retirement money, but I had enough money to spend for two years not working and just making sure that my kids were stable because they were very young at the time. And those two years ended up turning into 13 years, alhamdulillah, and uh, I started my project. And so that's my story. And the project is to solve the food problem. The project is Now, what is the food problem? <laughs> Oh, wow. Um, I'll, I'll be as concise as possible and we can get into a question and answer. So I'll start off by saying that um, just 1% of American um, soil is certified organic today. In other words, of the 911 million acres of farming land. In other words, they are spraying on 99% of American farmland, they are spraying um, a chemical or a pesticide on on the majority of our farmland, if not all of it. Yeah, think of it like a bug spray, like Raid, like you're about to eat and you sprayed 99% yes. of it with Raid and then you're being told to eat from that table. So, yes, so that's an example that we were speaking about earlier. Um, if I were to come to your dinner table and spray 99% of your dinner table with Raid, would you eat off of the 1%? No. So, let's just say that 1% is just that one dot. You wouldn't eat off the 1%. But in reality, the 1% is many dots that amount to 1% across the entire table. Right, right. In the speak in the speaking as it relates to farmland. Mm. And so um, organic farming is an island in a sea of chemical-based factory farming. And even our purest food that's labeled as organic is showing up with some sort of trace mineral, uh, some sort of trace synthetic chemicals or pesticides. And that's a problem. Mm. And I, you don't have to believe me that that's a problem. Just look at the evidence. The evidence is we are the sickest generation to date. Mm. The life expectancy of Americans has started falling four or five years ago. We are now falling in our life expectancies. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be the richest country in the world mm. and the most prosperous country in the world, and our life expectancies are falling. Mm. 
So that's the evidence. And more depression, more obesity, more... Not to mention. You know, yes. Not to mention every, every yes. other epidemic, we, the actual epidemics we have, right? That's right. So um, why is this dangerous? Um, so there's many ways I can answer this question. Um, so let's take one angle. If you want to function as a human being, you need to have balanced nutrition coming in. And if you've taken anything away from how my introduced our uh, how we introduced ourselves, I was anything but balanced in my own life. And so we have a God-given right to eat the purest food. And then after that, you go and till the world. And if we're not, if we don't have fresh water and if we don't have fresh food, and I use the word loosely because when you go to a grocery store and it's labeled fresh, it's anything but that. Mm. It's in fact guaranteed to contain, to have been sprayed with pesticide. <coughs> if it's labeled pure, all natural or fresh. And so there seems to be a, a, uh, an effort going on by the establishment. Uh, and I'm, when I say establishment, I mean corporatocracy to pollute our food, to make them dependent on medicines. It's a vicious cycle. And, um, you know, I don't expect you to see that circle now, but that's essentially what's happening is that that dependency is there in America where people eat food. They expect to get sick at some point in their life when they turn 55, 65, 75, and then their quality of life goes downhill. And I believe that once you turn 50, you do not have to age anymore. You can stay pretty much the same till the end of life and have the same quality of life that you have when you are at 50 years old. Mm, interesting. You know, I've been learning from the brother since yesterday, last night, Maghrib time, almost right, Maghrib time. So, you know, he said a lot of things that were very significant, and I just want to throw a few of them out there. I think Sheikh Tamer might have said one or two of those also when you two were talking to, or... Uh, indirectly at least. Um, one of them, just to talk about the coming to the urgency aspect, I mean, but just something, If you, a lot of you young people that are less than 50 years old, uh, because we're both over 50 basically at this point, and uh, you know, we remember being like in Pakistan, for example, and we're able to, even from a distance, able to smell the mango or the, uh, or whatever, fruit there was we were able to smell that but now you can go to walmart and you don't smell the fruits mm -hmm. right that was one of the points that was mm -hmm. made that's just to give you an idea of how watered down food has become so there, there's a whole maybe generation or two generations of people that really haven't experienced real food now at this point right and so that's one thing that I found significant. The other point you mentioned today that I found very significant. I mean, it's I, it was just so like, oh, that makes sense. Because it's one thing to take in vitamins, but it's a whole other thing that the vitamins be absorbed into your cells. cells. Right? And you said that that happens when you get two... Hormones, is it? Or two... Uh, minerals. Two minerals, right? Yeah. One was folic acid. Fulvic. Fulvic. F-U-L-V-I-C. Okay, F-U-L-V-I-C. Okay. Acid. Fulvic acid. Or fulvic mineral. Fulvic it's mineral. Same, same thing. Okay. And the second one was... Humic acid. Humic acid. And collectively, they're known as humates. There's more. Right. Those are the two most significant and ones. And the only way to make them is by having microbes, right? Yes. Interact with the tree the roots the of the roots tree. of the of the plant so if you're taking in a vitamin let's say you take in vitamin b or vitamin d or vitamin c that does not mean your cell is going to open up and say oh your vitamin c come in that's right until that vitamin c also has these particular acids then only the cell says okay you're allowed to enter that's right and the only way that can really happen is if you actually have food coming from the tree. Is that true? Correct. Coming from soil. Coming from soil. Microbial rich soil. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, to get deeper into that, um, satiety 
doesn't sit in the stomach. So when we eat food, we think, oh, we're full in our stomachs, let's go. Um, but in reality, why are people obese? Why are people, why do people continue to eat and have this feeling of the need to eat and eat and eat? The reason why the people need to eat and eat and eat and they feel this hungry and they have to eat three meals a day is because your cells are not being satiated. Mm. So what does that mean? The reason why cells are not being satiated is because we're not getting mineral absorption. And the better term to use are essentials. So essentials is a mineral is one thing that goes into our cells. So a better an umbrella term for stuff that goes into our cells to satiate our cells is essentials. So essentials comprise of minerals, trace minerals, enzymes, amino acids, carbohydrates, proteins. These are all molecules or you know that come into our body through food and we should enjoy our food. I'm not saying that we shouldn't enjoy our food through food and the more variety of food, the more colors as we have heard over and over again that that we eat, the more diverse the minerals and the more complete and balanced the minerals will be. Hmm. There's a, it's 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 a, it's a circle, it's a closed circle. We need 100 depending on who you speak with, we need 104 essentials every single day. Hmm. And if we do not get them, the body will then say let me get it from some other part of your body. If it doesn't get it from there, then the body goes deficient. The body remains deficient. And eventually that comes home to roost. It's almost like having mold in a house. And if you don't treat that mold, the mold continues to spread and spread and spread. And eventually the house will get sick. And people inside the house will get sick and the house yeah. will die. Yeah. It's the same with the, that's, that's my layman's term, layman's way of saying chronic disease, diabetes, headaches, it just rises, rises. Your headache is a siren call to let you know that you are missing something inside. And for me, it was magnesium. So just to go back here, you eat food, it comes into your stomach, it gets processed in the stomach with various acids and other stuff, and it enters into your intestines. And then the intestines mash up that food and extract the essentials into the arterial superhighway of our bodies mm. and it sends it to these minerals to all of all over our bodies to each and every single cell into our body mm. now what happens is that this essentials whatever the cell needs let's say it's magnesium it comes and knocks on the door of the cell wall of the cell, cell membrane and it says cell let me in if it came from a if it came from soil that was rich in humates and microbial microbes that made the humates, they will get let in. And the, the process of the essential, the magnesium to get into your cell is the fulvic acid will join onto the magnesium and the humic acid will dilate to the cell membrane to let it in like a toll booth. Mm -hmm. That is satiating your body For at real. the cellular level. To, to help prevent the mold <laughs> from spreading. Mm. If you get satiety at the cellular level, you will be satiated eating-wise. You will not need that much food. Mm. And that's why when you see people in um, other, in areas like the Blue Zones or some parts of Pakistan, some parts of Japan, uh, some remote parts where people eat off the land, they're thin. There's no, there's no obese people there. Mm. And they eat so little. And the reason why it's so little is because they're getting satiated at the cellular level mm. and they're full mm. over here. They don't need to keep eating. Okay. And so that, so, so just to finalize the thought, this fulvic, so this toll booth, this entry into the cell is created when plants grow in microbial rich organic soil. Mm. Now, what is microbial rich organic soil? Can I get into that? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I want you to think of soil, living. I'm going to call it living soil. I want you to think of living soil like a city, like Toronto or um, Shanghai or you know New York. What's a city? City on the face of it is dead. It's got buildings and concrete, and it's got windows, and there's some cars there. That's a city. If you just look at the city from that perspective, it's dead. 
But what makes a city come alive? Cities come alive when there are people that are with different skill sets, doctors, lawyers, plumbers, electricians, running around making the city hum. There's water flowing through the arteries, there's electricity flowing through the arteries, and all of a sudden lights, the city is alive, bustling, and the super highway is going, and that's what the city is. In the same way, that's what soil is. Soil has 150,000 different species of microbes mm -hmm. in it, and that's, that's what we know today. Mm -hmm. There may be hundreds of thousands, there may be tens of thousands more. Um, they all have jobs to do. They, each of these microbes have jobs to do. Mm. And they're all doing, they're shuttling minerals from here, they're breaking down atmospheric nitrogen for the plant to get nitrogen, they're uh, shuttling um, fungi from here to uh, exudates from here to get to the root of the plant because the plant called for it, the plant, the plant root called for it. I need food, I need food, I need this mineral, I need this mineral, and it, it keeps doing that. And in the process, one of the byproduct minerals that are created out of thin air, it's just created out of thin air, between this interaction are these two minerals. There are more, but the two main ones are fulvic acid and humic acid. Mm. You cannot create these in a lab. Mm. There, I think they are trying to create them in a lab, but they're, they're in their synthetic form. It's a different thing. And we can talk about synthetics versus natural. So our food, when it's grown the way it's grown, it lacks this. Uh, so okay so let's see okay so that's a living soil that's if you're eating a plant from living soil you're gonna get that absorption because you've got those minerals again I'm being simplifying tremendously there's much more complexity going right, on okay, okay. Yeah. now what's happening with our food we started the conversation off by saying 900 uh, just 1% 1 of the 911 million acres of American farmland are treated organically. The rest are treated with a chemical. If I came with raid or if I if I came if there's soil and I sprayed it with a chemical, what's gonna happen? The microbes are gonna some microbes are gonna thrive and some microbes are gonna die. It's a pesticide. It's, it's a, a pesticide. What it does is it creates an imbalance in the soil. So think of it like only doctors are running the city. There's no lawyer, there's no plumbers, there's no electricians, there's no that, only doctors. The city will survive for a while, but it's not going to survive for a very long time. And that's exactly what's happening with the soil. Our soil is pretty much dead, it's imbalanced, and it's growing plants without these absorbable minerals. And so when we eat this food, the food is not getting into our cells. Is this, when, is this something to do with when they say that topsoil is depleting? In the yes, that's exactly what they mean. They're saying, it in a, they're saying it in a very archaic way. I'm trying to give you a little bit more color. Right, right, right. Um, there's an imbalance that's created in the soil. That's the difference between living soil versus dead dirt. Dead dirt is just sand. It's just like that. Living soil actually has structure like a city. In and out of these holes and structure are the microbes that are going in, the worms, the insects, all of that is happening. There's so much going on like a city inside the soil that's living and structured. And, and a lot of what, from what I'm reading and when I apply Quran to what you're saying, mm -hmm. is that it seems like these microbes are serving the roots, right? One of the functions that they may be performing Absolutely. is serving the roots. It's like they've been created by Allah to serve the root so that you can get yes. what you're going to get. Yes. Right? Yes. And so what humanity is doing, what shaitan wanted, Allah, to change the creation of Allah, change the nature of things, right? And so he, this is where the problem is, is that now we're eating food that is not it's not pure it's not on its pitra it doesn't have the you used the word yesterday I really liked it it didn't have the nur that's right right it doesn't have the nur or you can say energy or the the f even frequency I guess at some level actually very specifically scientifically they've proven this it does not have the nur anymore genetically modified food does not have nur anymore uh, microbial void food microbial void grown food does not have the nur, meaning it doesn't have the smallest particle of light in it. 
we we are light beings we have nur inside of us i don't know the full islamic um verses but i do know that we have like you know they call it soul spirit ruh or livingness what's keeping us alive there's something inside of us and they've pinpointed it to light and if i start getting into what what's going on in our bodies as it relates to light and nur and how our cells are speaking to each other and how much information so nur or biophotons which is the smallest particle of light in the world contains more information than all the libraries combined in the world mm -hmm. One biophoton wow, coming from the DNA of our cell. So a DNA, DNA contracts, kicks out a biophoton. A hundred thousand times per second. And how many cells do we have? Two, three, four trillion. Yeah. It's happening two, three, four trillion times, a hundred thousand times. Mm. And each one of those small particles coming out from our DNA contains more information than all the libraries combined in the world. Wow. And it's talking to all the other cells in our body at the same time. Mm. And if that gets disrupted, we get sick. Mm. And we get nur from two main sources. I'm not going to say that these are the only sources. Two main sources. The one source is obvious, the sun. Mm. And the other source is food. Mm. And if we're spraying 99% of our food, we're not getting it. Mm. And we're getting sick. So, now... I, as an individual, I also now understand something very important that you mentioned when I look at the sayings of the Prophet Wasallam, and that is that maybe in the end of times, why many Muslims, according to one narration, where the Prophet talks about the man who will be living in the mountain, and he'll go where the water sprinkles here and water sprinkles there, just a little bit of water. But it also kind of shows how a little bit of food will be, in a sense, enough. enough, right? Even though, if you look at the hadith, it, it makes you think, well, it doesn't look like there'll be a lot of food. But these are the same people that later on will become warriors and so on and so forth. So it's enough nutrition to definitely survive, and it's going to be, even though less, but it's going to be, it's going to be wholesome, mm -hmm. right? And so what is... Now, let's come back to the Dijalic system in a sense that Dijal, the Prophet said, will give people a choice of food, right? right. And, uh, and, 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 and those that want to be with him, that's what they'll have to do, meaning he'll control that system of food. Why is this system of food that is industrialized, that has chemicals, I understand it's bad because of nutrition. So that's one very big reason. But... How are they getting, why are they getting control? Like, what's the mechanism that's allowing them to get in control? Mm. Uh, if you could speak a little bit about sure, that. Sure, sure. And the farmers and, and all that. Sure. So the statistic is that by 2050, they're going to be 60 to 70% of the population, world's population, are going to be living in cities. So there's a mass migration that's going on into urban areas. And this is by design, this is, well, whether this is by design or not by design, it's happening. People are gravitating away from rural and into cities. Now, in a post COVID, in a post, you know, whatever environment, I don't want to say word. Circus, <laughs> right. Circus, <laughs> circus, whatever. Um, in that environment, is that changing? Um, some people have become more aware and the people that were on the fence about leaving have left, such as myself. I've, I've left and I now live on a farm outside of Austin. Uh, and this is by design because of a potential fast tracking of this, the Jalik system that we're part of, that, that is clearly, um, you know, morphing in front of our eyes. So there are going to be 50 megacities by 2050. And again, that's accelerating. Now, what's a megacity? A megacity is a city that can uh, contain 10 million people or more. Uh, we already have those. Chicago, New York, Shanghai, Tokyo. These are all megacities, and there's going to be 50 of them. Um, now, when you build a megacity, it's made up of concrete. They're laying ever more concrete without any 
uh, consideration for food. How are we going to feed them? Well, their idea of feeding people is to drop a Walmart into a mega city and say, "Okay, Walmart, go ahead," or "Amazon, go ahead." You know, go feed the go feed the, the people. What do these people? What business are these people in? These people are in the are in the business of commod com selling commodities. They sell they sell glasses. They sell pens. They sell iPhone cases, and now they're in charge of selling our food. So what do they know best? They're basically in the business of commodifying, commoditizing our food, and so that's what they know best. So they go to a farmer, and they go to a small farmer that has just, you know, encroached onto the border of the mega city that they're building, or the city that that's expansive and building. And they go to this farmer, this small farmer, who's making food with love and care, and they go to him, and, and Walmart says, "I want a thousand heads of lettuces," and the farmer goes, "I can't do a thousand heads of lettuces. I can do thirty per month, or whatever the case may be." And Walmart goes, no, I need a thousand, and they all need to look the same.、Mm. And then they bypass that person, meaning they marginalize that farmer that's growing food with love and care. And they go to this factory farm, and they say, we need, yeah, sure, we can do it. We just need to expand a little bit more, expand a little bit more. And they keep expanding, and they keep eating up these small farmers, and they grow food in a factory-based way, like an iPhone cell case,、mm. cell phone case. And then they. Send that it it the farms are moving further and further away. We used to live around farms. Um, one hundred years ago, we used to eight one farm used to、uh, serve eight people. Today, one farm farm on average serves a hundred and four eighty people.、Mm. So that statistic should tell you something. One hundred years ago, there were six point six million farms in America. Today, there's less than two million, and that's speed feeds into that stat stat. So what's happening? It means Walmart is driving centralization. As these farmers expand and consolidate, they're all consolidated and expanding under centralized corporate corporations. And here's another statistic for you: there are four giant agrochemical companies that control sixty percent of our seed sales globally. That's an unbelievable. Centralization、mm -hmm. and power that's given to these people. They, the food may be cheap today. It's garbage. I would never shop at Walmart or Costco. I never, as a rule, go to shop Walmart or Costco. If you go to Walmart or Costco to shop for your food, you're basically saying I'm killing the small farmer.、Mm. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and, and and not to speak of the riba in all this, right? Because you can't be a big farmer without a huge amount of loans from the bank. And then you're in that rat race too. You can't even come out once you're well, in. Well, they're 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 removing that skill set of love and care farming. And that's another whole. So、yes. so one sin is riba, the second sin is you.、Uh, like Sheikh Tamer was saying yesterday, that when we were going to camping last week, we saw like cows like they're lined up like to to be killed. You know, basically they're lined up to be.、Uh, you know,、yep. they're not treated、no. uh, with love and care. And these, the, <laughs> so you can't put that energy into your body. It's going to make us sick.、Mm -hmm. If we put that sad, those cows are sad. Those chickens that are grown in these feed lots, they call them cafos.、Uh, I, I forget the what, what that abbreviation. It'll come to me in a second.、Um, they're called cafos. Ten thousand chickens under one roof, and they're given artificial light. They're not allowed to go outside, and they've turned albino in the meantime.、Mm. Um, yeah, they've turned out by now. I'm not eating that.、Yeah. I'm not eating that chicken. I'm not putting that. Do you think they're happy? I'm not putting that sad energy into my body. Yeah, they're not going to be giving duas when when they're going to be,、uh, you know. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a very very dark situation, especially when you look at the Quran and you notice the relationship between shaitan and poop. I mean, it's it's all over. The Islamic literature, but yeah, you know, kulu halal and tayyiba, wala tatmi khutwaat al shaytan. Eat from the halal and pure, and don't follow the footsteps of shaytan. Meaning that you have to, that if you're not eating halal and pure, you're following the footsteps of shaytan. And what's happened in the Muslim world is we care so much about the legal, legal, legal aspect of Islam that we haven't、yeah. realized that the spirit of the whole food. Has been taken away. Absolutely, no, absolutely. The, the roof, the, 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 the roof, the light is gone. The There's no light. Yeah. There's no light in those chickens. And so, even though something may be zabiha, but you still have the question of those farms having riba. 
you still have the question of how these animals were treated. You still have the question of if what these animals were fed. You still have the question of uh, what is the result of the malnourishment on these animals, even. Yeah. And the level one uh, Imam Imam uh, Imam Isa, who, who has come on my channel uh, several times, he mentioned that the level of selfishness is so much that they don't want pests eating from the crops. Right. Right. And to do that, they actually get rid or genetically modify it so that it actually, they take away the nutrition so less bugs will come to it. Yeah. Well, what they're doing is they're injecting, so they're, they're able to spray it with pesticides and the plant doesn't die, but the insect dies. Yeah. And the reason why the plant doesn't die is because they've injected the DNA of the insecticide inside the plant. Mm. So the plant doesn't die. Interesting. So the plant has the DNA of the insecticide. Pesticide, or yes, the the, the, yeah. That's interesting. Or the pesticide. And uh, yeah, I mean, so so this is what's happening here in the U.S. Right. Now let's talk about Muslim countries for a little bit. Sure. Muslim countries, just like American farmers, that had no choice but to give in to this system, so to say. Yep. Muslims who have been naturally cultivating everything organic and so on and so forth now are told when they take their loans by the IMF yeah, you need to buy these seeds from us Correct. that are those terminal Terminator seeds, seeds yes. okay, that if you grow one let's say uh, round or one harvest of uh, let's say corn you can't use the seeds to grow the next season uh, when, when it would be time so now Muslim countries like Pakistan India was doing it I think and then uh, Egypt does it like all these Muslim countries are now growing from and buying seeds that's and, and and there's a lot to this but can you speak a little bit about why are the Muslim countries falling for this I would call it ignorance jahiliya um, the farming knowledge has been extracted from us people the children You'll notice the farmers' ages are above 56 now on average. I think it's above 58 by now. Um, that knowledge is disappearing. That ancient knowledge is disappearing on how to feed humanity. Mm -hmm. And humanity's feeding is falling into the hands of large corporations. Mm -hmm. Is that really where you want it to be? They're not growing food with love and care. Mm -hmm. um, in the Muslim countries, there's a sense of uh, lack of... Uh, it's an inferiority complex. You know, we need to cultivate doctors, lawyers, accountants, and send them over to um, educate, get education on there. No one wants to be a farmer. Mm. It's an unsung hero's job. Mm. We just kind of cast farmers aside, as they have been. But the statistics are clear. Every great nation has fallen as soon as farming has fallen. As soon as, as soon as. Um, it's so interesting because the Quraysh mentions this. For the businesses that Quraysh is traveling, in the summer and the winter, right? Worship the Rabb of this Bayt, who has fed them from hunger. So, this feeding of a city, of a people, is what allows the rest of the business because if you that's how you have security, right? Yep. So if you don't have security, you can't grow business. But if you have no food, you're not going to have security. And so we're running into a place now where I want you to talk about this next. And particularly, let me just translate to Quraysh and maybe with that also in your mind, talk mm -hmm. about the future events. So Allah says, you know, we gave Quraysh the ability to travel in the summer and winter. So they should worship Allah, who's the Rabb of this house, uh, the, the Kaaba. The Rabb of the Kaaba. And uh, uh, he's the one who's been feeding them from starvation, meaning they have their own crops. And this is what Ibrahim du did dua, remember? His dua was that fruits from all over would come to Mecca. Hmm. And then, uh, and he kept them from a state of fear. So, with this in mind, now tell me, how is the, the eventual breakdown going to happen that you foresee? How is that going to happen with 
because you know Saudi Arabia is growing food. Yes. They're they're reviving plantation, and, and everyone's talking about oh one of the signs of the day of judgment that they're going to have agriculture yes. back in Saudi Arabia. Yes. That's happening, but it's happening in a negative way. That's right. And so the whole Muslim world is going into this fast food production type scenario. That's right. So there are a few questions that come out. Number one, what should the Muslim countries be doing, if not that? Okay. Second is that how is this food going to break down at the global level that will cause food scarcity? And one way that one brother, I told you about Imam Isa Woods, mm -hmm. he also, he mentioned this, that if you may remember, maybe you remember or don't remember, I kind of slightly remember that uh, McDonald's had been growing potatoes. Yeah. And because, you know, Allah has created many versions of potatoes and everything. But because now they've standardized everything and because everything is a cookie cutter, what happened is if something can get to one plant, it'll get to all the plants because they're all the same now. Mm -hmm. So they don't have, they, their, their ecosystem in a sense is weak from that perspective. Right. And what happened in McDonald's was that one of their, I guess, farmlands, the potatoes, something happened and, they, and it, then it like spread like, and, and they couldn't have those but they had a shortage of yeah. potatoes or something you, so yeah speak to this so um i'll give you two stats um the first stat is uh, 100 years ago uh we had 497 varieties of cabbage mm. today we have less than 28 so there's a biodiversity breakdown that's occurring right now in the world um and the re one of the main reasons for this is the example that you gave or factory based farming production of food which is happening in a monocrop way so instead of biodiverse way it's happening in a monocropping way they know how to make 1000 heads of lettuces really really well in the exact same shape that walmart wants it so walmart is demanding the food it's not the people mm. the people do not even know what they want mm. they think they want think something that tastes great they don't even know we have the age to under know remember what a mango tasted like when you bit into it yeah. the children of this generation do not even know that and so these corporations are able to inject the right trochanols and the polyphenols to give it the no, not the polyphenols actually to give it the taste that somebody that'll mimic the taste there but when I bite into it I am so attuned that I can taste the synthetic nature of that. And I, I, I shun it. My body shuns it. Mm. I can see dead food. Like, you know, have you seen the movie The Sixth Sense where the kid says, I, I see dead people. I oh, see right, dead people. Right. I see dead food. <laughs> like, I can literally tell even by biting into it. Either I see it, you know, through the eyes or I can tell just by biting into it that it's dead food and I just put it down. Mm. I'll, if I'm really hungry, I'll eat it. But it's begrudgingly so. Mm. So you talked about um, the breakdown of society and what Saudi Arabia is doing and really what the world is doing. And this is where I come in with my solution. Yes. Um, so what's happening in the world is there's a new technology that has... So you, you've got these mega cities. They're so massive that they have to truck food in. And when they truck food in, they need so many preservation techniques to keep it because on average it takes about five to ten days after it was produced i'm not even going to call it farming i'm not going to give it the compliment of farming after it was produced and brought into the city and about on average 15 to 33 hands touched it mm. and before it landed on your dinner plate mm. that's you that's the journey of your food um so to combat that what they're doing is they're creating warehouses inside cities and they're growing food in warehouses sounds great and i say go yeah, go more power to you but the technology that they're using is called hydroponics mm. and a lot of muslims are getting into it and a lot of muslims are saying we are look look at our hydroponic devices it's great yeah i've talked i've seen even um some of the uh what is it called um uh, preppers yes a lot of the preppers are also big into the yeah the, the, this. but if anybody cares about the climate or the environment hydroponics is an extension of industrial agriculture mm. it's by design somebody came up with it you can grow it they call it clean they, they call it everything except for 
organic. Mm. But now they're, they've gone to the FDA and they've asked the FDA to change the definition of organic to include hydroponics. Oh. That is how they call it organic. It is not organic. Mm. Organic is supposed to mean, actually organic does not mean this because they didn't understand what was going on in the soil. One person did know what was going on in the soil. His name is Albert, um, something Albert. Uh, his name escapes me. Albert Howard. Albert Howard. He was a biologist that lived in the late 1800s, died in the 1930s or 40s. And he started off <clears throat> by using chemicals, sorry, by using fertilizers, nitrogen. He started experimenting with nitrogen. Plants grew faster than he started experimenting. And what he found was, wow, plants grow fast. And this was during the industrial area. And during the industrial area, farmers wanted to comp compete with their industrial brethren, mm -hmm. with their factory brethren. And uh, later on, Howard took it back. He said, no, you can only grow. You're only supposed to grow that. But he was marginalized by that time. And the scientists took over and they ran with it. Mm -hmm. And that was, that's, that's how the, um, that's how the fertilizer industry was born. And that's why we have now a, a coming storm because of the Ukraine crisis and the Russia crisis, a coming storm across the globe on fertilizer stranglehold. Mm. Because the world, including Pakistan, including the Middle East, including America, um, has become reliant on fertilizer use that was started way back in the late 1800s by Albert Howard that reneged that so it's like a steroid shot or it's like a heroin shot once you give it to the plant the plant wants a little bit more mm -hmm. it wants a little bit more it wants a little bit more to such a point the plant if you take keep taking heroin you're going to eventually get really sick because the immunity is going to die so the plant's immunity and the soil's immunity has died and now they're so weak that that's when pesticides come that's when pests come and attack the plant because the plant isn't able to defend itself. And that's when they've come up with the new pesticide industry. Mm -hmm. And so it's this vicious circle of a heroin addict in plants. Mm -hmm. And that's where we are today. Hydroponics is an extension of industrial based agriculture. Mm -hmm. What that means is that they're growing synthetically on 99% of American land. And across the, if Americans are doing this, the Chinese are definitely doing this, yeah. and definitely the India. I would never eat anything from India. I would never eat anything from China. There's no regulations there. Even if it says organic, there is no way that is going to be 100% organic or biodynamic. Mm. And the Middle East, well, we don't get a lot of importation, you know, ex importation into this country from the Middle East, um, but they're not known for be being a food producer. Then there's Mexico. But they're all reliant on this synthetic-based agriculture or industrial-based agriculture, and hydroponics is an extension of that. And the world has moved, is moving into uh, it, the hydroponic industry being, being a $25 billion industry. And it's basically, what is hydroponics? Hydroponics is a way to grow plants that extend their roots into water, and then they add a nutrient into the water and make the plant grow. That nutrient is very narrow. It's only NPK. Meaning, what do you need a, to keep a brain-dead patient alive? You just need to feed it a little minimum slop, and the brain-dead patient is alive. Yeah, it's alive. Its heart is beating. It looks like a human body. Is it functioning like a human body? Is it, does it have the vitality of a human body? Is it healthy? The answer is resoundingly no, it's not healthy. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what's going on with our plants. Mm -hmm. They're not healthy. And so that's what hydroponic is. So when we eat that hydroponic plant, it's not getting, there's no microbes and it doesn't have the full spectrum of um, essentials that the plant is producing for absorption into our cells. And so that $25 billion industry is the industry that I'm looking to disrupt. Hmm. The hubris of the next Wall Streeter, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you will. <laughs> um, and so I've come up with a soil-based system that... Uh, so hydroponic also adds waste back into the environment. Right. So this is a this is a, a convenient, you know, a truth that nobody wants to talk about. And they talk about climate change, but hydroponics is the solution. But it's an inconvenient truth, really, um, that they add waste back into the system because that nutrified water is synthetic. And where are you doing with it? That that, that water is unusable, mm. and it gets chucked in. So now they're saying farming is contributing to climate change and environmental toxic disasters. Well, hydroponics is just an extension of that, and is doing this exact same thing. So I've come up with something that is a closed loop system that 
the 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 solution is called Tiny Farm. You put it on your countertop in your apartment, and it's a soil-based solution that's microbial rich. Right, and it's as big as a microwave. That's and right. You get to choose which fruits or plants or herbs you want. That's right. And uh, you put it Not in, fruits. and it's like a self-contained process you've made that grows organic food and it grows it in your house so you know what you're eating and it's not going through 50 people's hands and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you success in that um, before we talk more about your project I just wanted to um, ask one question sure is that how does this system break down over time or how does the jal get control sure. of it so much that they're like okay either you do this or otherwise you're not yeah. eating food yeah yeah so what's happening is that um, I, I, I mentioned that uh, for agrochemical giants like Bayer, which is which owns Monsanto, there's oh, a ch Bayer? The, oh, oh, Bayer Pharmaceuticals wow, owns amazing. Monsanto, and wow. the reason why Bayer bought Monsanto was there was an avalanche of eleven thousand lawsuits coming out from the United States against Monsanto, and Monsanto got acquired by a German company, and now uh, no th those poor farmers are not going to fight a legal battle against an international entity. And so this is their way of kind of doing that. Uh, then there's a Chinese company, then there's, I think there's Syngenta, it, that might be one of the four agro giants, and there's one more. Uh, they're controlling the six. So what's happening is there's a centralization. So what does the Dajjal mean? The Dajjal means one, one world government, one leader, one, you know, one, everything under one. One big deception. <coughs> one big deception, yeah. that's right one big controller of food and what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to decentralize food again and put it back into the hands of humans put it back into the hands of people so a democratizing of food if we allow if we continue to patronize Walmarts and that's going to lead to the breakdown if we continue to patronize Walmarts and the Costco's of the world we're basically saying let one world government own our food mm. And that is the beginning of the breakdown of control of our food and our bodies. So when things begin to break down in the city and food, your food, your banana is not coming from 2,000 miles away. Yep. Right? And people are fighting each other in the city. And now when they come up with a solution to that chaos, and they're like, yeah, you can have food. We do have the ability to give it to you. But now they're in control at this point completely. Exactly. If we are, if we cede control of our food production, and if we let that farmer who's growing our food with love and care organically get margin, gets marginalized and consolidated into a big corporation, how many, how many times have we as individuals been able to control Walmart, been able to control Nestle, prolific polluters of our environment and our food and prolifically winning in the court battles against the people like us mm. because it's just one of us that is fighting them we're not collective in fighting them if we want to be collective in fighting them then we we need to be able to take control ourselves but we need to arm ourselves with the knowledge of what food is and what it does for us so as long as we're going to patronize these big box stores that are providing us with our food we're basically saying one corporation go ahead and take over go ahead the Dajalic system take over and if we cede control to one a uh, one corporation then we're going to um, we're gonna yeah. lose control yeah and then once they're in control and once chaos has happened and you need them even more desperately right so you need them even more desperately. So now they really have control. Yeah, and they're putting they're putting stuff in our food that we know is bad for us. But it's again, it's something that we just kind of turn our eyes away from. But if we don't look at it head on, we're going to lose in the end. Mm -hmm. And they're going to come to you one day and say, <clears throat> "Do this because I have the food. Mm -hmm. Take this, and if you don't take this." Yeah. <laughs> then you're not going to get the food. You're not going to get the electricity. And um, then they'll say, okay, well, I'm, I'm, and by that time, you're going to be starving 
because you will not be able to get into Walmart or Costco without the card, without the pass, the QR code that they gave you. And if you're not growing food yourself, you're going to be starving. And at that point, you will have a no choice decision but to take whatever they give you so that you can get the slop that they're serving to you in Walmart and you will have no choice. That is the grave train, locomotive train that we're on, that if we don't get the ignorance, the jahiliya out of our systems and educate ourselves about what our sources of food are and, and get to our sources of food and start clo you know, producing our own food, we're going to be at a loss as communities. So the food we're eating right now is spiritually low grade because it's, it's, it's a product of cruelty and injustice. It's injustice to even the local farmers. It's injustice to the animal. Uh, and then it's the malnutrition aspect to yourself. You're eating food that has no nutrition in it. Even though you feel like you ate a lot, quantity-wise, but in the end, it's, it's not doing its job. And then, because they control all the seeds, they control the world food supply. And as the world begins to break down, they will be actually able to uh, exert themselves on the individuals who want food even more. That's and right. so that's what it seems like. And so the general will say, hey, you want food? Okay, I'll give you food. And then you'll be part of my system. That's exactly and right. the only way out of that system is you have to grow your own food or you have to rely on nature. You know, uh, and 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 that is what you've come up with. Right. So, while the corporate world is destroying soil, that's right. The brother here has a method of remaking fresh soil. He has a process that allows for real topsoil, if that's the word, right? Real topsoil, living soil, which no. has things like mushrooms, worms. Uh, you talked about compost. Yeah, uh, biocompost. Yeah. Bio compost. So we have, it's called warm castings warm or, or warm, com warm, warm vermicompost. Okay. Which is the byproduct of worms, uh, worm poop, essentially. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the fertilizer from the cow poop, too, right? There's yeah. There's some in there. You don't, the way they, the establishment uses cow poop, they say, oh, you got to put patties everywhere. No. A cow poops over there. A cow poops over there. A cow poops Just over there. It. Just leave it. It'll come. It'll make itself there. Right. That's yeah, yeah. Eventually, everything will. Yes. Yeah. The, the the plants call it, and it can. The mineral can come from miles away. Mm. Not miles away, but a long a long distance away. One of the things you talked about that I found very fascinating was the difference between, and this is again talking about the malnutrition and why their system is going to break down. Is the difference between the fire hose and the call for uh, yeah. nutrition? Can you explain that? Because I think that was very fascinating. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a perfect system, yeah. but yet man insists yeah. to make something different so that he can make money. Right? Yeah. Basically, it's all comes down to dunya. Yeah. Really. It's, the, it's the hubris of men knowing more than God and having that hubris and that greed uh, because they want to extract from the dunya. Um, it goes back to fertilizer. Um, what they're doing is they're adding, so what they've done is, in reality, plants need, to knowledge today, 26 different <laughs> inputs into the soil. And those inputs are garnered naturally mm -hmm. from the surrounding areas. So wherever there's fertile soil, the, the microbes shuttle it back and forth. But these clever, <laughs> you know, people, uh, men, <clears throat> say, oh, the plant needs NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's the sum of the fertilizer. It's like me, when you ask for a glass of water, instead of giving you a glass of water, I give you a fire hose to mm. drink from. And you're like, you know, I can't, I can't take it, I can't take it. That's exactly what's going on with the plant. When you add NPK, it's like drinking from a fire hose. But the difference is that the plant can't say no. You can say no. The plant just takes it and grows, and the plants grow bigger. So anywhere you find, at Walmart especially, these big sweet potatoes or these massive uh, lettuces and watermelons, they have no taste. The reason why they have no taste is because they've been force-fed 
to and they they have no choice but to eat it and they grow into these massive um entities fruit entities and uh they have absolutely no nutrition in them and whereas the natural way you were saying is that the root or the tree says hey guys i need such and such yeah. mineral or so the microbe goes and says okay i'll get it for you and it goes or the microbes the set of microbes go bring shuttle it back and uh, provide it with the sip of water or the sip of nutrient essential that they need at right. that time in real time in real time and then you know so for instance let's just take nitrogen the most abundant element in the world is nitrogen 70% of the earth's atmosphere um is made up of nitrogen and all the the, the bacteria you have to do microbes bacteria same thing they go in the soil they go up they extract the nitrogen from the atmosphere they bring it to the plant the plant takes what it needs and then they go back and it releases it mm. this is how smart the stuff is that's going on down down yeah. there so there's no way for man to compete with the system allah has created right the earth was created not at this point right by yeah. any stretch <laughs> cuz allah made the earth for man to mataun walakum fil ardi mustaqarrun wa mataun ilahin and you have a place on the earth for a certain time as a place of stability mustaqarrun wa mata until a certain time yeah so the the earth is there to sustain us and what we're trying to do is we're trying to develop a system that looks natural but it's not natural that's right. right and we've done this across the board we've done this with our milk you mentioned a very important point that i'd like my listeners to hear what did you say to sheikh tamer about milk well i said um we don't drink men don't men, drink men don't drink milk um, men don't drink adults milk. adults no. don't drink milk yeah we're not supposed to drink not milk. as much as we do through cereal and, and that's right milk. no not at all yeah we don't we're, we're not supposed to have um milk um and there's a there's a massive effort going on and this is known this is not me making this up this is known and you can go ahead and you can potentially google it if google hasn't wiped it out but um you can potentially there's lots of um evidence science based evidence research done that adults should not be drinking milk wow it's 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 made for the babies the babies use it to grow it's best from the mother nursing um uh, because all the minerals are in the mother and that's what the natural way is mm-hmm. and then you you go and so and then uh, you and Sheikh Tamer were also talking about especially not cow milk right so the prophet had for example goat milk or he had cow milk right the goat milk is the least uh you can say likely uh, should be the last in the categories of which i find very interesting so i you know so i as a rule and one of the reasons was estrogen right so this is like right and which is feminizing the men they are yes right and i remember um the 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 doctor that wrote the boy uh, the book called boys adrift which talks about why men nowadays don't have that much motivation in life and this was one of the reasons he's mm. mentioning in his book is plastics estrogen like things like this are yeah. affecting us anyway so that was very interesting so now so what the brother did is he looked at this scenario and he developed a counter to this scenario which is why he's important for the future inshallah because no one else is doing what he's doing so he has a way of growing fresh top soil there is special ingredients and it has um you know uh worms it's, it's microbial rich microbial rich um, okay. it's it's a bio, it's it contains biocompost so it's not, in other words i'm taking you back 100 years to when the soils were <coughs> um pure untouched with any sort of input or synthetic and um grows and and has the diversity of the microbial population to grow a plant. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have worms in it, right? Because this is for the home, but it has the, the micro- worm byproduct right. microbes in it um to uh, grow your plant with the same thing. Now, will they run out? Yes. So we talk about all of that during, you know, once we release the product, and once we finish releasing the product, all of that 
all of those things we're going to be talking so about. So the first thing I want everyone to do is a special dua that all the brothers' efforts, because he's literally put his whole life to this. Like, I don't want to like expose him and 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 you know, but just take me for at my word. He's put his life into this, and so he needs your duas. And number two, if there's somebody there that I would say have that's willing to invest ten thousand dollars or more, you can. I'll put an email. I'll probably put my email and then forward them to you, or we'll figure it out. But I'll put something in the comment section that you can, if you're interested, if you're really interested and want to talk to him and see if this is something you want to invest in, and you have more than ten thousand dollars. Well, he's looking to raise about three hundred thousand dollars, which for the Muslim community really should not be a big deal. Now, before we go further on that. Let's talk about your the response the Muslims have given to you. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> even though many of the scholars have seen this as a positive thing, but yeah, tell us, I mean, Muslims should be jumping on this, right? I mean, this is what the Quran tells us to do. We have, we, we literally, if we had have the true knowledge about what the Prophet has taught us um, in terms of being leaders, in terms of being the, the holders of the trust of taking the world to water, you know, and metaphorically speaking, um, we have that knowledge in the Quran. And um, the only way to understand that is to understand the times that we live in today um, and the grave nature of the times that we live in today and the seeding of control to large corporations that have absolutely no interest in us as humans except for profit. And we just want to live like humans in, in a dignified and respectful manner and the prophet taught us that. And so what, what I'm trying to do is bring dignity back to just one thing, food, which is, again, as I started off in the introduction, food is a basic thing that Everybody, rich or poor, should all have equally pure food without question in an affordable way and water. And then after that, you go and till the, till the earth, you know, till the dunya and make your money and do what you... This is a God-given right and I'm just trying to bring that to everybody. Rich or poor, it doesn't matter. This is made for everybody. But, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly the problem. Like, Sharia does not allow... I'm not talking about the FDA patent. Uh, yeah, yeah. And all. The Sharia does not allow uh, privatization of natural resources. Yes, that's right. You cannot right. privatize oil. You cannot privatize plants. You cannot privatize corn. You cannot privatize uh, gas. You cannot privatize these things. It's not and allowed. It's, it's, it's happening across the board. And if we don't stand up collectively, and we have the ability and, 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 and the, to stand up collectively. The sad thing is that <coughs> Islamic organizations like Jamaat Islami, like Hizb tahrir even to some degree Tanzim Islami, uh, Islamic organizations that are standing up for Khilafah don't realize these issues. No, they don't. They're talking about things that before eating you can't accomplish. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not eating pure food, you're not going to be able to accomplish it. And the Prophet ate the purest food and he ate very little mm -hmm. at the same time. Yeah. And if we don't, we have the, as a Muslim community, as Muslim lead, leadership organizations that are established communities around a masjid, have the structure to basically serve their communities through, through that structure and through food at the same time. Mm. And I'm calling for a reform, not a reform, I'm calling for an extension of the masjids and the communities that are out, the community centers that are out there, to extend the structure of their masjids, the non, that non-profit structure entity, and add on a CSA, which is called, which stands for Community Supported Agriculture. Mm. And you feed your, you feed yourself, you feed your com the immediate uh, mosque goers, and you feed the community around you. That's that is that's something that's different from and what I'm Muslims doing. And Muslims went into this, and every Muslim yes. did this. Yes. At a time of crisis, Muslims yes. would be able to feed their neighbors. That's right. And we right. and that's right. And you you would see so much, um, you know, community, not only um, amongst our, ourselves but the wider community of non-Muslims alike, uh, coming together and protecting us. 
Yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly how it's supposed to be is that where even non-Muslims are like, yeah, that's what I want. That's right. That's right. You know, that's right. They're looking. America is desperate for leadership. And the leadership is not going to come from our po- politicians and the leader, the so-called leaders of the world. It's going to come from us. And uh, uh, we are not going to ha- have it unless we educate ourselves about what it is that Allah is asking and the Prophet is asking us to do. And, and, and that is serve the community. And this is the best and probably the most dire, desperate moment that we need to jump on this. So, so I'm doing it. I'm doing it in my own way. But communities can do it in, in their way, too, mm-hmm. such as yourselves, and, you know, so, which is what you're doing. Um, and then um, Muslims need to jump on this because uh, we, are, we are supposed to be the solution to tell the world, look, guys, you're eating food that's not good for you. This yeah. is real food. right? We should be doing this. We should be the ones that are saying, this is not real money. This is real money. That's right. right. So it's it's. I mean, it, and so this is very very important for Muslims to respond to this positively. So number one with du'as. Number two, if you are interested, then I'll have an email in the comment section. Send an email, and then uh, if there's a a lot of interest, then I'll ask the brother to do a Zoom meeting where yeah. he can do like a you know a a, a more business style discussion and answer any questions at the business level. But he's trying to launch this uh, product that is not just for the house, but then there's another product that's for your hijrah, right? That's for like if Muslims went off to another land, you're also working on that as, as one of the, uh, I think, your projects you said. Yeah, so there's a couple of projects where um, we're working on <clears throat> uh, remote if people are deployed remotely, for instance, and you can build. So we have a home. So my company is called Mod Garden, and we have. Oh yeah, can can we can you uh, spell out your website? Sure, it's uh, Mod Garden M O D Garden dot com. Okay, M O D Garden dot com. Everybody right. got that? Okay. So, Go and see the website. So just you know. So we're we're doing a home based appliance. I call it the fifth appliance because I think as companies like Bosch have reached peak appliance, mm-hmm. uh, they're going to be looking for an, another product. And so I think that this is going to be the new appliance of the future that everybody that owns a condo or a home is going to say, oh, I've got a fridge, I've got a microwave, I've got an oven. Oh, I need a tiny farm. Uh-huh. And so our product is called Tiny Farm. Right. Um, and then we would do the soil. So we're talking with, we're speaking with real estate agents also. So right now what I'm doing is for the last four or five years, I've been working on this project. I've got six prototypes. I've perfected the soil. And we have a team, and we're basically now at the door of commercialization, and we're trying to commercialize our product. So we're raising a big round, um, but we're raising it in pieces. And the first piece would be three hundred thousand, and then we're we'll be raising another million five after that, inshallah. And like I said, for the Muslim community, this is nothing if they're interested. Yeah. And then you're also working on for like, uh, like a jama that would want to do hijrah to a certain place, That's and right. then. So, so you're yes. also working on that, and that's, that's right. maybe a different conversation, maybe for a different time, which yep. will also be a need at some point. So, so that's why those of us that are thinking of okay, we're going to make a Muslim village, like yep. if you make a Muslim village, let's say in Pakistan, or you make a Muslim village somewhere, right? If your Muslim village is using the same pesticides, fertilizers, you're defeating the purpose of leaving right. the city. Right. <laughs> right. I think I think I'm not wrong about this, but you know, Pakistan is one of the most Pro- prolific users uses of pesticides. <coughs> I think they're number two in the world in in fertilizer purchases, and I think it comes from Russia. Um, and that's not a good thing. That's that's not a good thing. We have to wean ourselves off of that. It's very easy to do. We can create, but you know, going back to community and making hijra or, or going to a community. I am living on a farm in a camper, um, and I'm learning how to farm outside. I'm doing farm. The, my solution is farming for urbanites, because the urbanites are going to be in the most desperate situation mm. with respect to getting essentials into our cells. Mm. The name of the game is not filling up our stomachs. The name of the game is getting essentials into our cells to remain healthy. You may go hungry, but you won't die, and you'll also be healthy. Mm. So you might go hungry for that one a few few days bec- if you're just eating greens, but you Which won't is die. Very interesting point yeah. you just mentioned. The prophet was hungry. But he was healthy. That's right. That's right. 
That's right. So the two don't, like we usually think, oh, he's strong. If you're hungry, it means you're not healthy. Yes, no. But that's, that's not, not true. That's not true at all. SubhanAllah. Yeah. Okay. So I have a way, I understand how to get it into your cells by cr- making sure that the soil is the purest it is. And what does pure mean? Pure means that it's balanced. Mm-hmm. It's got the right microbial population, the skill sets uh, in it. So that's what I'm trying to bring to the market. And the hijra that I've made is I've got, I live on a farm and I'm learning how to farm, but I'm also creating an alternative, helping, helping create, not, I'm, not, I'm not the one creating it helping support any community that is looking to create an alternative to the current establishment that is just not serving us yeah, the way is, this is this is going to break down because yeah. it's not it doesn't work in a full cycle no. right it it just it kind of like makes what it wants and it's it's it doesn't it's have greed based it's greed it's based. one way and then it always ends up with polluting something that's right it's 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 taking from the earth and spitting out and polluting the earth on the other side. So I'm trying to create, I'm trying to c- create something. They call it a regenerative city or they call it a, uh, a net positive city or uh, regenerative city is probably the best way. And I'm trying to do my part to create a regenerative city for food, meaning a closed loop system, meaning we are going to use Earth's resources and we're allowed to use Earth's resources as long as we don't give back less than what we took out of Mother Earth. We have a fidu- we have a, an amana, a, a responsibility to, yes, take from the Earth because the mana has been given to us, but then return back more than you have left. And that is prophetic. Hmm. And so... What is, subhanAllah, this is just so amazing because if we can, you know, it sometimes comes to my mind as I look at all the sayings of the beloved Prophet about what will be happening in the future and where we are and just so amazing about when you look at his narrations and then like when you're talking about nature and you know, a big part of this has to do with nature, right? And when I envision the two lines of battle, truth versus falsehood, um, I see the falsehood coming from cities, and there are a lot of them, but they're all weak. They're not, they're malnutrition, they don't have, they don't have nutrition. No. And even though they're, they're more in number, in quantity, they win the game of quantity, but they're so weak that those that are outside the city, uh, the skill set that they learn and the brother yes absolutely. And, the, and the brotherhood that they learn yes. and the and the togetherness and yes. the fatua that they learn and the brotherhood that they learn and the the bravery that they learn and the food that they eat right and their muamalat with one another their their engagement of natural engagement of gold and silver however that natural environment will be whether it's trade through commodities of food versus salt for example but the point is, this will be a much healthier group with the Mahdi, right? They will be people who will leave the cities Inshallah. to go to the Mahdi. Yes. And uh, so they will be outside the cities, and they will be in a much more natural, strong, healthy environment. And maybe the army of the Dajjal, or the army and the falsehood, feels very satiated, right? Yes. They, they feel very satiated. Yes. You know, They've we, got lots of money. they got a lot of money. <laughs> They're going to feed a lot. They're not going to have nutrition. No. And the other side might be a little bit hungry, but guess what? They're healthy. Yep. And it's like, and so what do they have on their side? Maybe might be some technology or something like this, but the other side is going to be healthy humans who have really reached a very high level potential of skill uh, in different arenas of life. And so... I think it's gonna, you know. In fact, Iqbal says in one of his poem, uh, "Iblis ko Europe ki machino ka sahara, or moment ko hai brosa, uh, something like moment ko hai brosa, khuda pe brosa, uh, or moment ka sahara hai khuda pe brosa, something like this." I'm saying it wrong, but the Europe will be relying on its machines, but they will be unhealthy, is what I'm trying to mm-hmm. say. But they'll have their machines. And the other side will have Allah on their side. And they will be trusting Allah. So this is like how Iqbal envisioned 
uh, this wow. final uh, wow. clash <laughs> wow. of, of truth and falsehood. Not a clash of civilizations, right. a clash of truth and falsehood. Right. And so, uh, anyway, so I think we'll end here. Please don't forget to do dua. Please remember to see the comment section information I have uh, for those people that are interested. And Jazakumullah khairan. So I think this has been a very important episode. I'd say one of my most important episodes. So please do share this with your brothers and sisters. And we need to create this awareness as Muslims that we need to be eating better food. And we need to create this awareness where the governments are like, oh, what are you saying? You're not getting... Now, you know, the, even the uh, people in authority, the, the, even the ulama, give it to the ulama. Let them listen to this, right? That this is just another extension of how food has been corrupted. It's not just that we're not eating Zabiha food, or it's also that... Um, we're eating food that's just simply not food anymore. We're, yeah, it, it, it's, it not cannot, food. it's not no. food anymore. So, inshallah, you can earn your reward that way, and uh, and then this way uh, we can create more awareness in the ummah. So, thank you very much. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi